Greetings, church family. This is Terrence. It's so good to join you online. Now, here's what we're doing. It's a little bit different. We're not sure what's going to happen with the storm this weekend. So we hope that we can meet in person. But if we are uh, prevented from doing so because of the amount of snow we get, then we'll at least have something online for you to watch. And so we're trying it out. Bear with us. It's a little bit different, but we just wanted to have all of our bases covered. Okay, uh, speaking of bases being covered, I hope you have your calendar already filled in, right? Christmas in Truckee is one of the coolest things we do all year. It's our Christmas Eve gathering. And here's what I love about it. Instead of being in a church with the four walls and the doors and people might or might not come, we go to the town. We go to the people. So we rent out the train station parking lot on Donner Pass Road, Main Street. Uh, we rent a stage from Crux, and we, we, we have bands. We have Christmas carols. We have giveaways. There's candle lighting. I mean, there's so many cool things. And here's what I also love is um, that the town of Truckee has partnered with us this year and a couple other local organizations. And so we're so grateful that we get to uh, bring this gift to Truckee. And here's one more thing. We don't take an offering at it. We don't ask for any money. In fact, the church is paying thousands of dollars to make it happen because we hope that somebody might hear how much Jesus loves them, that Jesus is the real meaning of Christmas. And so if you support this church with your finances, you make things like Christmas in Truckee possible if you give online or in person. Thank you. And please help us finish strong this month. We're counting on it. Uh, we count on you. We, we couldn't do what we do without you. We couldn't be who we are without you. Now, speaking of Christmas in Truckee, one of my favorite things we do is how we end Christmas Eve, how we end the night. We, uh, we start with a candle on stage, and then we pass it to one person, and then they light their candle. And eventually, the entire crowd is filled with candlelight. And we're singing the song, Silent Night. Now, I don't know if you know the words to Silent Night. I recently discovered, I think a few years ago, that I've been singing the song wrong my entire life. Uh, the lyrics are, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round, yon, virgin, mother and child. I always thought it was round, young, virgin. That's what I was singing as a kid, and it just made sense in my mind, right? Mary was young, the Bible tells us that, and she was pregnant, so she was probably round. Now I'm a bit older, a little more educated. I understand that's not the case. But women, let me ask you your opinion on that one. Uh, do you mind if someone calls you young? might be considered a compliment to some. Yeah, young is not so bad. Uh, but what about round? I, I don't think men or women, male or female, want to be described as a shape, right? Round. Um, I'll give you this scenario. I try not to uh, offend people. And uh, let's say this. Let's say I'm in front of a hospital and I see a woman who is, looks to be pregnant. Um, and she's walking into the hospital, into the maternity ward wing. Even at that point, I still would not say, when are you due? Right? That's too big of a risk, too big of a gamble I'm not willing to take. I think that if I did that and she wasn't really pregnant, then my soul would just die a little bit. Uh, the correct <laughs> lyric is, round yon virgin. And what does that mean? It means that everything around her is bright, everything is calm for her and the child. Now, did you know that in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only two of them talk about the virgin birth. That's Matthew and that's Luke. And both Matthew and Luke insist that it was indeed a virgin birth, a woman who was a virgin who gave birth to Jesus. Now, you don't have to be a scientist to know how this works. I have eight and nine-year-old kids at home, and they know how this works, right? Conception does not happen without a mother and a father. So, so what are Matthew and Luke describing here? How is this possible? Well, the truth is it's not possible, at least not without a miracle, not without the intervention, the disruption of God's power in this event. It's a God-created, miraculously impossible event. Now, th there's no denying uh, that throughout history, the virgin birth, birth has been seen as scandalous or supernatural. Even Thomas Jefferson cut it out of his Bible. He couldn't wrap his mind around it. It's interesting to me that I've had conversations with people, talk to people, um, who've, who say, I'm okay with the angels. Uh, I can, I'm all right with the star. I'm into that. I can even put up with some of the miracles of Jesus, but come on, a virgin birth, you lost me there. I cannot get on board there. That's just 
a little too far. Now, or I've heard, why is that even in there? It's so strange. Like, like why is that even part of the story? Isn't it, isn't it crazy enough that God put flesh on, came down, and incarnation with us? Like, like, why does it have to be a virgin birth? Well, here's the thing. God could have arrived on this planet any way that he wanted. And that's true. And God wanted it to be through a virgin birth. God even tells us that this is going to happen 730 years before, right through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Now, the Greek translation of the Hebrew word that's in the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. It uses uh, the word parthenos. Parthenos, that's the Greek word for virgin. Now, the Hebrew word that's also used for this is alma, and alma actually means young women, woman. Now, scholars have debated back and forth, like the NASB says virgin in, in Matthew, and then the NRSVU and updated version, they say young woman woman, and people are like, oh, like, so then was it not a virgin birth, or how does that work? Um, well, as much as scholars would like to debate about this, either one of these still supports each other. Mary was young. Mary was a virgin. They're not mutually exclusive. They can actually be pretty symbiotic, and it still tells the same story. Now, I'll tell you why. Here's some context in this passage in Isaiah, why that's not a hill to die on. Now, the book of Isaiah takes place in 730 B.C., okay, 730 years before Christ. And there's a king of Judah, uh, Ahaz, and these are the people of God, and uh, he's stressed out. He's worried because the Syrian army is breathing down his neck, and they're saying, we're going to destroy you. And then they're starting to get allies that also want to come and destroy Judah, march into Jerusalem and destroy Ahaz, and so he's afraid. And so he starts thinking, should I now get an alliance with Assyria? And if I were to do that, then I'd have to put up with their foreign gods, their foreign worship. And so this is where Isaiah comes in. Isaiah comes up to Ahaz and says, you're stressing out over this when you shouldn't be. Uh, why don't you ask for a sign from God? And Ahaz says, I, I'm not going to ask for a sign from God. I'm not going to even go there. I'm so stressed out. I don't even know what to do. And Isaiah says to the king, on behalf of God, God says that you can trust him and that you can ask him for a sign. And he says, and here's the sign. The sign is a virgin shall conceive. And by the time that child is mature, your enemies that were going to destroy you will be destroyed. How's that for a promise? How's that for faith? Now, this is King uh, Ahaz, and so there, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And he needed to trust this verse. Now, Emmanuel literally means God with us. That's what Isaiah is telling to Ahaz and the people of God. He's saying God is not only for you, God is with you. How about that? Just like you can't see a way out of here, right? You're, you're, you're doing the math, aren't you, Ahaz? You're counting your army, and you're counting all of the other armies. You're looking at your nation, and you're looking at all of the other nations that want to destroy you. Now, these powerful kingdoms are coming, and you have no clue how this could possibly end well for you. There's no way on earth, logically, right? You can't win with your numbers. You can't win with your army. All the odds are against you. It's downright impossible. Exactly. Just like it'd be impossible for a virgin to give birth to a child, right? There's no way that that's physically, scientifically possible other than if God was with us, other than if God intervened, right? You can't picture this happening without a miracle. And that's why you need me with you, Emmanuel, God, with us. Because without God, you are going to lose. Without God, you are toast, you are defeated, you are done. Without God, a virgin cannot be a mother, cannot give birth. It's impossible. God brings a small-scale event like Ahaz in this 
war to a cosmic scale of fulfillment in Jesus. Now, I, I want you to think of a time. Would you think of a time that maybe you've been scared? You've been full of fear. You've been stressed out. You're anxious. You can't sleep. Maybe you're overwhelmed. You're full of doubt. And, and you think, there's no way. Like, there, there is no way that this is going to end well. There's no way that I could maybe even picture how this could be a, a good ending or, or I could get through this unscathed. And God says, do you need a sign from me? Are we like King Ahaz and we say, yeah, but God, the numbers don't add up. God, the, the future is looking uh, grim. The prognosis is bleak. The bad guys are going to finish me this time. And we say, this is just impossible. And God says, you're right. It's pretty dire. It is impossible unless I'm with you. And if I'm with you, then the impossible becomes possible. Good thing that I am Emmanuel with you. Um, this is not the, the, the exact truck, um, but some of you know the story that when Kate and I moved from uh, North Bay, Mill Valley, uh, before we came out here, in Salt Lake City, our U-Haul was stolen at night, overnight, out of the hotel we were staying at. And I just, uh, and I remember we walked out into the parking lot where the U-Haul used to be, and we were just distraught, like sick to our stomachs, like crying, like, uh, I mean, that was just me. Kate was fine. <laughs> I mean, it was bad, right? Our kids were confused. All we had was our backpack we had brought into the hotel with us. All of our lifelong belongings, everything, you're talking like from, I don't know, wooden kitchen spoons to socks to teddy bears to can like, you name it, everything. All of my tools, everything was gone, all of our clothes. And um, we went to U-Haul, and they're like, yeah, we're not, we're not going to cover that. We went to the, the hotel, and they're like, no, 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 we're not responsible for that. I talked to the Salt Lake City Police Department, and they were like, sorry, we can do nothing for you. You're just out. I called our auto insurance, and they're like, oh, yeah, no, we'll reimburse you up to $250 if something was stolen from inside of your car. Can you believe that? So we drove for two days from Salt Lake City all the way to Chicago, and we were in some place in Nebraska, right? And, and hey, there's like two days of just silence, two days of just the trail of tears, just a sad, sad, horrible, horrific trip. Uh, and, and then we stop at this, this rest stop in Nebraska, and I remember it's like vacant, like we're by ourselves, and then uh, we get a phone call. And the phone call was from our homeowner's insurance. And they said, um, you know, when you moved out of your house just north of San Francisco and Mill Valley, you tried to cancel your homeowner's insurance. And one of the agents was like, well, why don't you just wait to get through the move before you cancel? It's only three more days. It's not going to cost you money. And so we said, uh, I guess, because we were loading the U-Haul, we we're moving, we we're saying goodbye. Like, we had so much to do, try to loose ends. We were just like, okay, fine. We'll just let it ride for three more days. That's what you told us. Fine. We forgot all about that. And because we kept our homeowner's insurance, even though this was stolen in Salt Lake City and not in our home, they were home possessions. I don't even know how the loophole all worked, but the insurance company said that we are going to reimburse you for the majority of your stolen items. Now, Kate and I did not see that coming. Our family and friends did not see that coming. We had no clue how that would possibly pan out for us. We accepted the loss. We said, this is our new reality. We are over. This was our fate, and we've accepted, and we couldn't believe that God was merciful to us beyond what we never ever could have imagined or hoped for or even prayed for. Now, I want us to look at a few stories of the impossible that are all interconnected to the birth story of Jesus. Now, Luke begins his gospel uh, this way, up in the hills uh, of Jerusalem, and in the temple, there's this priest uh, Zachariah, right? And, and he has a vision where an angel tells him that he's going to be a father. He's going to have a son. Now, Zachariah um, is 92, and his wife Elizabeth is 88, and they were unable to have children their entire marriage. But this prophecy says the impossible will become possible. You're going to have a son. Now, I want you to remember this. This wasn't a virgin birth. This was going to be an old-fashioned kind of 
birth. And so first of all, I'm just happy for this couple that these two at 92 and 88 still have the mojo to see if this prophecy will come true. And sure enough, the prophecy does come true. Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And they name him John. And John will now fulfill uh, a promise to prepare God's people to meet their God. An impossible miracle only becomes possible if God intervenes. Now, another one before this one is Abraham and, and Sarah. And Sarah is so old at this point uh, with no children. Uh, she's 90 and Abraham's 100 that when she hears, hey, you're going to become pregnant, she laughs out loud. She's like, there is no way this body is going to carry a baby, right? And then again, God does the impossible, and Isaac, their son, was born. And that miracle fulfilled the promise God made to Abraham, and it was the birth of a nation of Israel. Wow. Prophecy fulfilled through the impossible birth of Isaac. Prophecy fulfilled through the impossible birth of John. And the greatest of all, prophecy fulfilled through the impossible birth of Jesus, of God with us, showing himself through miracles, right, uh, that could never happen without his intervention. Now, this is how the, the story goes down. Many of you may have heard this before, know this. Um, an angel speaks to Mary. An angel says, you uh, will have a son. You're going to bear a son. And uh, his name is going to be Jesus. And in Hebrew, that means the Lord saves. Uh, the king that will rule forever, this is Jesus. And she says, well, how is this possible scientifically, physically, logically? Like, like, like how is it because I'm, I'm a virgin, there's, there's no baby in my womb, right? Yet, it's impossible without God. And that's the point. It is crazy without God. It makes no sense without God. Virgin equals no baby. And here's the other thing. There, there's, there's, well, we're on that line of reasoning. There's no creation without God, right? There, there, there's no sustenance, sustaining of life without God, and there's no salvation without God. Intervention, disruption is needed from God, a holy disruption from God. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. It might not make sense to you of how the order of things have taken place here. Uh, theologian Russell Moore says it this way, just like Abraham and Sarah could not produce Isaac, Zachariah and Elizabeth could not produce John, Mary could not produce Jesus, and the world cannot produce its own redemption. It's impossible. There's no way around it unless God is involved. Now, that's why the virgin birth is part of the Christmas story because uh, the point of the story is we can't help ourselves. We can't save ourselves. We cannot be saved without God. What we need is a miracle. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, Jesus. That's what a real Christmas miracle is. Not just a miracle that happens around the Christmas season, but a miracle that happens because of the creator of Christmas does the impossible. I want to close with this last thought. Uh, in the first century, uh, the apostle Paul was a missionary. He was going around and he was preaching. And he was preaching mostly um, to, to Gentiles, people that were not Jews, uh, that they might convert from Greek and Roman uh, mythology, religions, like think like, like Zeus and Jupiter and Mithraism and Zoroastrianism and all these other creeds and sects where, get this, virgin birth stories were actually quite common. Um, they were the norm. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, Perseus was the mythic Greek hero who killed the Medusa, right? Well, his mother said to be impregnated by a god. Um, Sebel, or Nana, the mother of Attis, a semi-deity of Phrygia, eastern Turkey, was impregnated by what? An almond or pomegranate tossed away by the gods. Ra, the Egyptian sun god, was said to have no father. And his mother, Net, conceived by, get this, parthenogenesis, 
What does that mean? <laughs> that means there's no conception of a male and a female. It's like within the male, female body, uh, then parthenogenesis. It happens on its own. Other, uh, Horus was another Egyptian god conceived by parthenogenesis. Uh, other pre-Christian figures believed to have been born of a virgin include Sargon from Babylon, Adonis from Syria, Osiris from Egypt, uh, Dionysus from Greek, even Apis, the sacred bull of Memphis was to have been, uh, been fathered by a god striking a cow with a ray of moonlight, <laughs> right? That's how he was conceived. So common, and I want you to hear this, so common was the belief in the Greco-Roman world that many mortals were even elevated, given this uh, retroactively status of virgin births. That's how sought after it was. That's how people wanted it to be true so much. And I'll give you some of those Romulus and Remus, Pythagoras, Plato, Apollonius, Alexander the Great, uh, the Roman Emperor Augustus, Scipio the Elder, and uh, all Egyptian pharaohs. Did you even know this? Even Buddha. Even Buddha is said to have descended into his mother Maya's womb in some supernatural celestial way. Now, some scholars believe that at the time of virgin birth was widely thought to be a prerequisite for divinity. If you weren't born of a virgin in a virgin birth, then you couldn't be a god. You couldn't be divine. It was almost necessary. So whether that's true or not, Paul's Gentile audience was primed to accept a virgin birth as clear proof of the arrival of a messenger from God. Now, I want you to, to hang with me, okay? We're, we're wrapping this up. I've heard the argument that, well, Christianity uh, just copied these prior religions and myths. See, that's not so. But, but this is true. Many of these virgin birth stories were clearly told and circulated well before Jesus' virgin birth. I, I, I agree with that. Like, like that's historical. We, could, we can say that that's accurate. And to that, I totally agree. But that doesn't make Christianity like, like merely a copy of them and an impersonator of them. And I'll tell you why. On the contrary, that makes Christianity the only true religion, right? Because all of these others claimed, quote, unquote, a virgin birth, wanted, desired a virgin birth to be part of their story of deity, right? But Jesus is the only one that actually happened, the only virgin birth. Out of all of the Greek pantheon and the, and the Roman thoughts and all of the, these Egyptian, like all of them, in Buddha, Jesus is the only one that was actually born of a virgin. Now, to me, the widely documented presence of virgin birth in many religions makes Jesus the obvious choice for them what you've been writing about, what you've been talking about, the stories you've been telling, the, 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 the birth story that you want, the narrative you wish were true, those are all made up. But guess what? That actually did happen with Jesus. That's the actual true story of Jesus' birth. Now, this is my hope for us. Every time we read the Christmas story or, or we sing the song Silent Night, May we be reminded of the God who makes the impossible possible. And as we look around and say, there is, there is no way I'm getting through this. There's no way I'm coming out of this. There's no way this is, this is going to work out. I need a miracle. Well, think of the Christmas story. It only happened because of a miracle, a birth that wasn't supposed to take place, and a name it says, God is with us who saves us when we can't save ourselves. Pray with me. Jesus, thank you for Christmas, and thank you for the miracle of Christmas. Thank you that you make the impossible possible. Thank you that you are the God that can do all things, and you are the God who saves us because we can't save ourselves. You are the God who forgives us when we need forgiveness from you. So continue to speak to whoever is watching this. And I pray that if you're listening to this right now and you have questions about who Jesus is, that you shoot us an email, you give us a phone call, you show up on a Sunday, 
Join us for Christmas Eve. We believe that God loves you, that he is for you, and he has a purpose for you. All right, we'll talk to you later. Bye, church. Merry Christmas.